Thank you very much. And so our second speaker is Albert Huang, who is a professor of medicine uh, here at the University of Chicago, a general internist. And he's uh, one of the, I think, uh, most thoughtful people here at the University of Chicago. And he, has, he again, it's like a Paul Farmer, he has the ability to sort of integrate sort of um, understanding of individuals and people with macro health policy. Um, he is an uh, international leader in terms of geriatric diabetes policy, uh, cost policy analyses for diabetes, and spent a year uh, in um, the Obama administration uh, after the Affordable Care Act. Uh, he was one of the people that wrote the regulations for implementing the Affordable Care Act. So, Albert, uh, geographic disparities in diabetes and obesity and the long arc of health policy. Good morning. So I'm going to um, talk about two things you probably already know, but um, uh, two, two long-term uh, trends that are happening. And I'll try, I think what I'll be enlightening is talking about the intersection of how uh, the, the uh, diabetes, and obesity, diabetes and obesity epidemics are clashing with what's happening in healthcare policy. And it actually, it relates to environmental policy. And I, I didn't realize uh, until afterwards that my talk's really about what's happening with the Trump administration, both healthcare policy and environmental policy. I did not intend that to be the case. But um, nevertheless, uh, thank you for having me. So, um, you know, when we talk about the long arc of, um, of civil rights, but also the long arc of healthcare reform, um, uh, one basic point is that healthcare reform in the United States, uh, however you view it, um, each incremental change that has happened in our healthcare system has taken decades, or has taken a long time. It's uh, certainly beyond the, the uh, my own lifetime, but um, uh, you know you have to realize that health insurance itself was not uh, a normal thing until after World War II. Employers did not provide health insurance um, a nor uh, until it became a need to incentive uh, to encourage um, uh, to attract uh, employees. Uh, in fact, uh, physicians in the American Medical Association opposed the um, health insurance itself, and for many decades opposed the adoption of, 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 of something like Medicare and Medicaid for, for several decades, uh, with uh, uh, President Truman uh, failing to pass uh, uh, universal health insurance. Uh, and it was not until 1965 that we had um, Medicare and Medicaid. And um, I don't know if, uh, who, who knows who was the last state to uh, to actually uh, have a Medicaid program in the United States. Arizona, right. So it wasn't until the early 1980s. So Medicaid was passed in the mid-60s, but it wasn't until uh, the early 80s that all states in the United States had adopted a, a Medicaid program. So it just takes a long time for any program, even after legislation is passed, it takes a long time for implementation. And you can see all the various things that happened in between. We didn't have EMTALA until the mid-1980s. People could be refused care at insurance at, at a, a hospital emergency room if they had no health insurance until EMTALA was passed. The Clinton uh, re health reform effort failed in the early 1990s. I was in medical school by that point. We didn't have health uh, prescription drug coverage for um, Medicare recipient uh, beneficiaries until 2003, passed by a Republican um, President Bush, and we didn't have the Affordable Care Act until 2010, and we had to elect our first African American president in order to pass the Affordable Care Act, and that was the first, that, since, from 1965 to 2010, it takes that long for the next major expansion of insurance coverage uh, an over a 40 year, 40 year period. Um, so this is uh, just some, some pictorial um, illustrations of the long arc of healthcare reform in the United States. Does anybody know who the older man is on, on the right? So it's Harry Truman. He had the first red, white, and blue card, and you can see Bessie Truman behind him, uh, Vice President Humphrey. And it was not until, and, and from 1965 to 2010, is uh, when we next have the next major expansion of insurance coverage in America, at least sponsored by uh, uh, through expansion of Medicaid, but also the creation of insurance exchanges. And uh, does anybody know the older white man sitting next to President Obama to the left, to the right? Uh, anybody from Michigan? John Dingle. John Dingle. So John Dingle was an early champion of healthcare reform, and um, so y y you always you, you always want one of the old uh, the the. the People fighting the good fight along the way uh, to be present for uh, uh, the passage of major legislation. Right.
That's right. So that just re-emphasizes again the intergenerational time it takes to, 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 to bring about healthcare reform. So what's happening at actually a blistering fast pace compared to reform of the healthcare system is our concurrent obesity and diabetes epidemics. I know that the uh, opioid epidemic is um, very, very important and is killing people at an incredible pace. But this epidemic is happening also and has generally gone unnoticed uh, over the last couple of years. We've been distracted by many things in, in the political discussions, but this epidemic is happening. Uh, this is the picture of obesity prevalence in 2011, and um, we had to create new colors by 2016 to reflect the uh, rising uh, prevalence of obesity. Um, for, uh, these are, this is the picture, the geographic map of obesity prevalence across the United States. Um, you'll, I, I've actually never thought this would happen. I remember being interviewed 10 years ago about obesity prevalence at around 30%. I said, it's not really possible for the whole country to be obese. Um, <laughs> but uh, it turns out that there are some states with obesity prevalence now, uh, now close to 40%, which, um, and, and actually we are really losing the battle in, term, in terms of combating the rising prevalence of, of obesity. And you can see these concentration of dark purple states that have um, obesity now over near like 38, 39%. It's incredible. Um, and the same thing is happening with the related condition of diabetes. So this is, uh, the, the, this is prevalence of di diabetes by counties in the United States. Um, it, overall in the United States, we have a prevalence of around eight or 9%. Uh, but you can see that there are some pockets of the country that have counties with prevalence rates over 11%. This is the picture in 2004, and this is the picture in 2009. It's really a quite devastating, um, and we are approaching a world where we're gonna have to be all in mobile devices with little uh, joysticks to move around uh, while sipping soda. Um, and so it's a really uh, catastro you know, catastrophic epidemic. It's not, got, not gotten much attention. It's not very sexy. It's not cancer. Um, it's not the opioid epidemic, but it's uh, causing devastation um, in terms of healthcare outcomes and healthcare costs, and likely to be a bigger driver of healthcare costs than any of the other epidemics we've talking about. So why is this geographic disparity? You can see that some parts of the country have less obesity, some have less uh, diabetes than others, and why is that the case? And this is a beautiful um, gra graphical depiction of the complex relationship between demographics, social environment, in the built environment, our relationship between race, place, and poverty. And you can imagine an individual is somewhere in this three-dimensional space. And those differences between the social environment and built environment, coupled with our, our, our ethnic uh, and racial differences, our differences by age, all lead to difference rate, different rates of these uh, chronic conditions of obesity and, um, and diabetes. And, I have to properly attribute this to, this was created by one of our research fellows, Liz Tung. It's a beautiful graphic showing this complex relationship between uh, these different um, uh, uh, exposures that increase our risk uh, of, of chronic conditions. And if you uh, think, and this is a, um, a, a classic um, model of social determinants of health that links all these factors together, uh, at the macro level, the meso community level, to the interpersonal level, down to the individual. And you can see how um, the built environment and the social context um, can uh, facilitate, can increase our exposure to stressors in our, envi in our local environments. The, the state of our public health systems, our, uh, the availability of, um, of healthcare services are affected by policies within the social context. And, um, and so on, and eventually all this flows down into uh, the creation of health that manifests in obesity and diabetes is just one, one example of, of health outcomes that matter to us. So the other dimension, I just show you that three-dimensional space of the built and social environment, but the other big factor that is ignored by policymakers is really about timing. At what point in the time of a person's life are they exposed to this world? And um, this just goes, this is just a, this is a graphic from a, the landmark randomized controlled trial of diabetes, uh, of diabetes care. It's actually a trial called the United Kingdom Prospective Diabetes Study. It's one of the, it's a study that will never be repeated again because it took 20 to 30 years to conduct. 
um, actually ran out of funding at various times. Um, but it's the trial that basically justifies our, the way we treat people with diabetes. Um, it, it's the one that justifies the lowering of blood sugars in people with type 2 diabetes. And it turns out that they uh, in, enrolled people who were newly diagnosed with diabetes in their 40s and 50s, treated them intensively with multiple medications in the first 10 years of their diabetes. And then they, uh, the trial actually ended, but they continued to follow the people over time. I don't know if this works. And you can see here, this is the, at the at trial end, the two arms were already separated in terms of uh, events. Uh, basically, if you had lower sugars, you did better than if you had higher sugars. This justifies our use of a lot of diabetes medications. Despite the conclusion of the trial, the differences between the two arms persisted. This is what we call the legacy effect, and a legacy effect of glyce early glycemic control, meaning if you treat people at the right time of their lives, if you address Health, chronic health conditions at the right time, there'll be benefits for those people and benefits for the health system decades later. So if you were to re go back in time and, and revisit healthcare reform in America, you would never start with the creation of Medicare and Medicaid. You are missing, the, you're, you're not insuring uh, health, uh, health insurance for the people between uh, the ages of 40 and 64. And it wasn't really the, until the Affordable Care Act that we were able to um, um, have um, ensure uh, health insurance for that populate, that demographic. So when health, when the Affordable Care Act was passed, we wrote this, uh, Nita Leiterpong and I wrote this thought paper that sort of anticipated the health consequences for chronic diseases related to healthcare reform, that the Affordable Care Act created opportunities to maximize health of a population and based on the UK PES. And we really thought, and this actually has partially happened, um, on, Rates of uninsurance have declined dramatically for people who were uninsured. Um, and the idea is that if you're insured, you're more likely to get diagnosed and you're more likely to be treated at the right stage of your life. And this could reduce delays in treatment. This graphic just shows that the longer your delay is in terms of treating blood pressure in a person with diabetes, the, the greater the risk of future events such as amputations, renal failure, um, heart disease. The problem is, or depends on how you view this, the, the rollout of the Affordable Care Act has been completely dependent on the state. So a key landmark decision by the Supreme Court in 2012 allowed states to expand Medicaid um, if they wanted to. And this is, uh, the orange states are the ones that have, de have declined to ex expand um, Medicaid, but the blue states have expanded Medicaid. And so Medicaid expansion um, for the low-income individuals is variable across the country. And um, so I want you to think about how this will intersect with the obesity and diabetes epidemic. And remember the graphics I showed you earlier? Where is obesity and diabetes most prevalent? It's actually where the orange states are. So what's hap what, what do we actually know has happened? This is a study that I've done with a recent graduate student, Rebecca Meyerson from the Harris School, where we've taken a look at prescription drug claims related to diabetes. And basically what's happened is in states that expanded Medicaid, rates of prescribing for commonly used diabetes medications have shot up and are significantly different from states where they haven't expanded Medicaid. So you can draw your own conclusions, but likely these, this is a mixture of people with newly diagnosed diabetes or now treated diabetes that was previously untreated. So people in the, Medi in the Medicaid expansion states are getting exposure to these glucose lowering medications. Um, so there is a, and you can imagine, so what will, if you connect this with what we know from the clinical trials, you can anticipate the likely health outcomes that will happen by states. Um, another thing, um, another part of the um, environment is of course our public health systems. And public health systems are quite variable. And this is a typology created by Glenn Mays to describe health systems that are comprehensive, conventional, and limited. And basically the ideal system is one that is comprehensive, that has a broad scope of recommended population health activities, supported for, through dense networks of contributing organizations and sectors. This is one where the public health, um, um, public health departments work in concert with hospitals, clinics, and so on, and are well integrated and, and basically carry out the activities of normal pop population health. And what he's found is that if you compare counties that have comprehensive health systems versus those that are not comprehensive, that there's a, a difference in mortality rates across these counties. So uh, even if you don't adopt Medicaid expansion, there is something that one can do locally to have a more comprehensive health system, um, even with constrained budgets. 
And the other thing that's happened is, of course, environmental policy has changed a great deal with the new Trump administration. And there's a separate line of work around environmental exposures. It turns out that air quality is a predictor of diabetes risk. Water quality is a predictor of, uh, of uh, diabetes risk, including uh, potentially pesticides in the water in some farming communities may be increasing the risk of diabetes. And our counties, this is a county level uh, picture of the, this is a bio, uh, if you look at the, the, the counties that have darker colors, the darker the, the color, the healthier the overall environment is in terms of air and water quality. And uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of pale colors, again, in the deep south. Um, so again, this is another factor, uh, another policy tool, uh, another policy that is affecting our overall obesity and diabetes epidemics. So if we don't make significant changes, and I don't know when this will happen, um, state disparities in diabetes outcomes are going to widen due to variation in Medicaid expansion. So I am expecting something fairly catastrophic in the next two decades in um, the southern states that did not expand Medicaid um, with a far, they're going to have a, uh, you know, if, if you want to invest in dialysis centers, the time is now. Um, <laughs> Obesity and diabetes disparities within states, I think, unfortunately, are going to widen because of cultural changes. There's increasing co-location of the exposures, policies, and people. Um, and this is part of a, you know, the, the worsening um, uh, divide between different kinds of people who live different ways and uh, by education, race, and by policies. Um, but you know, the, the, sil the silver lining might be that there may be ideas for change that may come from identifying communities within non-expansion states with low obesity and diabetes prevalence. And maybe state and local experimentation with limited resources might provide some, uh, some opportunities to make a difference. And this is a graphic from the state of Georgia. Uh, this is the diabetes prevalence across uh, counties. And there are, you can see there are a few counties with lower uh, rates of diabetes and uh, the question is why, and could they potentially provide us some roadmap to uh, better health? So I hate to be um, kind of a downer, but um, we have to keep our eyes on the ball on this really important epidemic, which is contributing to geographic disparities, but health disparities in general. The diabetes and obesity epidemics have not stopped. You just have not, you, we've just stopped paying attention to it. The public health and healthcare and environmental policy sector are intersecting to cause um, what we see today. Uh, this in, within generation change in our health status. Um, uh, we are doing some work that I want, if you're, I'm happy to talk to you about. We have a Medicaid working group. The University of Chicago is now investing in a national purchase of in the entire country's Medicaid claims data, and we are um, hoping to make this place a, a major epicenter of Medicaid research. And, um, if, and, and we also happen to have on campus uh, uh, the Center for Spatial Data Science, which is led by Luke Anselin. He's essentially the best spatial uh, uh, geospatial statistician in the country. Uh, so more to come, more that we can do to highlight this, um, this convergence of policy and health epidemics. Thank you very much. In light of the problems that are developing at a, at a upper policy level in the government, do you know of any work with um, grocery store chains or any of the private sector, for example, at least when it comes to climate change, some businesses are saying to hell with Trump and his administration, we're going to stick with. Uh, all the regulations that Obama uh, was uh, trying to promote. Have you been able to, in other words, stir up any interest in the private sector, grocery stores, et cetera, who will have some effect on the food that people have and that potentially lead to the diabetes you're concerned about? That's a great question. Um, and it's really a question about, you know, can we can things be done locally despite federal policy? And the answer is actually yes. And, and actually one of the following speakers, Monica Peake, is probably the best model of this, where she's uh, been able to uh, collaborate with local grocery stores, 
like Walgreens, um, and, um, and, you'll, and you've noticed probably the movement of Whole Foods into um, the Englewood neighborhood. There are things un underway that, that can be done to incentivize um, better food, um, a better built environment for people to, um, to, to encourage exercise. And um, so yes, I think that there is a lot, and this, uh, that's, the, that, that's what I wanted to end on is a, hopefully a little more hopeful note that there are little local, this local experimentation I think that can make a difference. Hi, Bob, Bob, Bob Chung from here in Chicago. My question is, what do you think makes the South different? Um, so I did, not, I did not say this directly, but um, it is really, uh, I, I, I think it's amazing, the legacy of old, uh, of history and of older policies. And um, it's probably linked to, you know, uh, slavery, Racism, the Civil War. I, I wanted to actually find show a map of the the Civil War, the Confederate States, but they those states were the states that were the, some of the last to adopt Medicaid. Those were the states that actually have they actually have some of the smallest uh, state contributions to the Medicaid program itself, um, and the, and so it's just it, it, it uh, we're repeating many of the thing many of the things that are hap that have happened in the past that are repeated again and again. And um, I, I don't know if it's, a, if it's cultural or historical, but um, the, the long legacy of old policies is uh, with us today. Thank you.